Dear friends, welcome to the channel The Eastern Front. Today we will dive into the memoir of a corporal of the 132nd Infantry Division of the Wehrmacht about the battle that happened at the end of the June 1942 near Sevastopol. The fight that changed his life forever. And in the end of the video I will tell you a story from the opposite side. And don't forget to press like and leave a comment, let's start. All I have left are my memories and old photo album. There is nothing else and there is will be nothing more. I'm living out my last days in a boarding house for the elderly near Magdeburg. Relatives and the grandchildren sometimes come to my neighbors in the boarding house, but no one comes to me. I have no one else. After the war I didn't get a family. The war took away not only my youth, but also the hope for a normal future. Even old colleagues don't come to me. The fact that is that even after the war I didn't have the happiness to communicate with them, to remember the frontline past. All those with whom I started this fiery and bloody path almost completely remained lying on the ground of the Crimean Peninsula. Few people even in modern Germany know that from the autumn of 1941 to the summer of 1942, our 132nd Infantry almost completely renewed its composition twice due to very high losses. I don't know by what miracle we were not disbanded at all. Now I look at my prayer wall photo and I think about how young and full of energy I was. I thought that after the war I would return to an even more beautiful and great country. My chest would be decorated with awards. How I could tell interesting stories for hours about my adventures and the places I had visited. My track record will be like a key that opens for me all the doors of success in any career whatever I choose. The most important thing I dreamed of was a big house, children and a girl I would call my wife. After the war I will get married for sure. That's what I thought at that time. Everything was crossed out by the Eastern Front. All my hopes were killed by that June day of 1942 near Sevastopol. The day when I became a freak forever. There is not a day that I don't reconstruct from memory, bit by bit, every episode of this fight and don't think about how I could have avoided what happened. Mentally, I very often go back to that early morning in summer of 1942. The dead have woken up, get up Helmut, I say the Russian dead have woken up, Zomer was yelling in my ear, go to hell idiot, let me sleep, I muttered angrily in my sleep not yet fully understanding what had happened, but already clearly hearing the sounds of the fight breaking out. It can't be, they should have all died there, I exclaimed, jumping up and rubbing my eyes. God, when is this all going to end? How long have I not slept properly? They didn't die, Helmut. Unfortunately, five minutes ago this Evans threw grenades at the second platoon and fired at Bachmann's department in the casemates. The orderlies pulled out who they could. The sergeant major ordered you to raise the whole platoon, remove everyone, even those who stepped into the outfit. There are not enough people. Damn it, damn stubborn pigs. I swore dirty. Can't you just give up and stop torturing yourself and us? It's already over, how are they? They don't think it's over, we have to go Helmut, our people are dying there, everything else is after, Zoma cut me off. When we went outside, the flamethrowers had already come up, I had a quick roll call among my platoon, checking the equipment and everything necessary. I had a difficult decision to make, I had to choose those who would be among the first to kill the dead again, who would storm the underground battleship, choose those who would go to die now. We called the underground battleship a large caliber turret artillery battery of the Russians on the northern outskirts of Sevastopol, which we first called Maxim Gorky and we called its staff and gun crew dead men. Whatever you call the structure, it still had one synonym, death. 
In addition to the guns themselves, there was a whole complex of underground communications capable of conducting an autonomous and long-term defense, and the towers themselves were concrete pillboxes. And in addition to everything, the garrison of this death machine was staffed by a Russian madman who lacked a sense of self-preservation and a desire to live characteristic of every person. The Maxim Gorky battery interfered not only with us, it interfered with the entire 11th Army of Manstein and disrupted the assault on the fortress city of Sevastopol from the northern direction. The commander of our division, Lindemar, wanted to curry favor and hope for promotion, so he decided to take this damn underground battleship at any cost, regardless of losses. For two weeks now, we have been killing Russians and dying ourselves. Two weeks of beating the shit out of us and the spirit. We have completely surrounded the battery for a long time and cut it off from all communications. I personally crawled with Henry and his people, made sure that there was not a single telephone wire left, not a single thread that would connect the garrison with the outside world. We managed to knock down and damage all the radio antennas. The Russians had been out of communication for a long time. They didn't receive food and ammunition. But we couldn't wait for them to completely use up the ammunition. Every volley of this monster cost us very dearly. We were not helped by our bombers, which threw the heaviest bombs they could lift. Volleys of large caliber artillery didn't help us. They couldn't break through thick concrete. The Russian battery was still standing and continued to snap fire. The whole space around the battery, the whole earth is disfigured by deep craters, but the battery itself is standing. When they ran out of ammunition, they started firing at us with training shells. When they ran out, the Russians let Johann's platoon get closer and shot at them with a jet of powder gases. Almost nothing remained of the platoon. It was a truly terrible sight. A jet of gases of enormous temperature swept away people and from the high temperature skin and meat were torn from the bones. I'll never forget it. When we managed to break through the complex closely, then flamethrowers, burning gasoline and oil went into action, which we poured into the ventilation to them. We didn't want to smoke them out, we wanted to destroy them all. We hated these Russian pigs, I think they hated us no less. When we thought that the job was finally done and we could finish off those who remained inside, the dead came to alive and launched a counterattack. We failed to get inside this concrete fortress. We received an order to withdraw. As soon as we replenished our ammunition and didn't have time to lick our wounds properly, we again received an order from the divisional commander Fritz Lindemann to storm this burial ground. People didn't want to go. Replenishment didn't have time to cover our losses. We used up all the explosives. We were wildly tired. We all wanted to leave. The Russians repeatedly tried to break out of their fort into the Lubimovka area, but were cut off by fire. Our troops were already standing in Lubimovka. Even if the Russians had broken through, I knew there was still a group of fanatics in the fort. The command decided that even if the guns of the battery were no longer firing, it was impossible to leave a garrison in the rear that had not capitulated. That early morning, when Zoma picked me up, we went on the assault again. I really hoped that this time it would be the last. I remember how we managed to approach the entrance to the complex quite easily. It was already closely surrounded by our assault groups. I had a great desire to stay in charge of the assault and not to meddle into the heat. There was a bad feeling. And the thought was in my head, don't go, don't go. I looked at my guys, we had already lost too many. I couldn't sit behind their backs. They wouldn't understand me, they wouldn't forgive me. Authority and respect at the front is the quality that once lost you can get back. As usual, we started with flamethrowers, and then we burst inside. The first two Russians who crawled out to meet me on their knees, I cut off with one burst. They didn't even see me. They coughed and squinted their eyes like moles underground. I jumped over them and ran on, looked around the corner, it seemed clear, took two steps forward and a flush. 
I regained consciousness a couple of times. I was drugged by our orderly Rouse. I recognized him by his voice. I couldn't see anything. My face burned like a hell. Sticky blood flooded it. It was a grenade. Its fragments cut off my ear, knocked out my eye and split my cheek. I underwent several very difficult operations and barely survived. For this fight I didn't receive the Iron Cross, only a patch for injury, a patch for fighting in the Crimea, a badge for hand-to-hand -hand combat and was formally promoted. What's the use? What's the point? I was no longer fit for service and for further normal life. I didn't care that we still took this damn fort and soon our troops took Sevastopol. I was sick of the victory marches and the hysterical jubilation on the radio that we listened to in the hospital. Why do I need this Sevastopol? I was left without an eye and an ear. I am disabled. Maybe the Führer will return my ear, maybe the Manstein will give me an eye, or maybe our divisional commander who killed a lot of people for the sake of his Iron Cross and the gratitude of the command. I returned home only in 1944, when Sevastopol was already lost to us and occupied again by the Soviets. I returned to the city, which was almost completely destroyed by the bombing of British. There were so many refugees, the destitute and the disabled on the streets, that no one cared about me. Things were going so badly at the front that the Wehrmacht also didn't care about some commissioned soldier who had already solved his time, given his health and youth for the Great Reich. With such an appearance, I couldn't count on a normal job and happy family. All I have now is an old photo album, a boarding house for the elderly and memories of soldiers, of my friends who never returned from Crimea. Now, the memory of them is kept only by the surf of the Black Sea, which is alien to us. From the memoir of Helmut Ficht. Helmut's memories are valuable primarily because they restore the last days of the battle, of the legendary, and now forgotten by many abandoned battery number 30, or battery Maxim Gorky, named after the famous Russian writer. The gun complex slowed down the German assault on Sevastopol and held down the forces of an entire division. For almost a whole month the battery fought in complete encirclement. Soviet soldiers, officers and sailors with honor and heroically performed their duty, inscribed their name in eternity. The commander of the Sevastopol battery number 30 near the village of Lubimovka, Georgi Alexandrovich Alexander, on 24 June with a small group of fighters, went at night to the Belbek river. A few days later, a traitor from the locals betrayed Alexander, and after being tortured, he was shot in Simferopol prison. The memory of him and other soldiers is immortalized by a monument at the mass grave of the 30s battery, and also one of the streets of Sevastopol received the name of this courageous man and soldier from his homeland. Since Crimea has returned to Russia, you can be sure that no one will change the names of streets, as they do in Kiev. In 2016, the streets named after General Vatutin, who took part in the liberation of Kyiv and right bank Ukraine, was renamed Shuhevich Street, who was a nationalist and Stepan Bandera's right-hand man and took part in the murders of Poles, Jews and Soviet citizens. The battery was restored and functioned from the 60s to the 90s. The guns were replaced with the new upgraded ones. At the moment, the battery is in conservation, but can be quickly put on alert. Dear friends, that's all for today. It was Team in the Eastern Front channel. Please write your comments, what do you think about this story? It really helps to promote the video. And as usual, I wish you peace and health. See you.